The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is taken according to Mark in the seventh chapter. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. But the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they thoroughly washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there is also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and brown, bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of their elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and you hold to human tradition. And then he called the crowd again and he said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile from, for it is from within, from the human heart that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these things come from within, and they defile the person. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise We have one small child. I will not subject her to a kid's sermon all by himself. <laughs> Unfair. About a few months into our marriage, Leslie said, Could I ask you a favor? And I said, Sure. Would you fold the towels this way? <laughs> you remember that? Judaism is a stronghold point in Israel. And part of that 
tradition is, of course, you do not work on the Sabbath. It is very important. It means that you do not do anything that is, can be construed as any type of work. So if you were in Israel and you were, let's say, in Tel Aviv, and you wanted to go up to, say, the 14th floor of a hotel, you would find that on Saturday, which is the full day of the Sabbath, you would go into the elevator and you would stop at every floor. Isn't that interesting? Because you see, pushing the 14th button is doing a work. And so in order for you, if you are an Orthodox Jew, not to do that, you simply waited floor to floor to floor to floor. That way you wouldn't have to perform a work. Now, of course, that, of course, is a severe degree. And that's something that we find hard to, to really understand, uh, especially we who are brought up in this idea, uh, especially we Lutherans, that somehow all of this is superfluous, and then we put these things aside in favor of the freedom of the gospel, that we are justified by faith, apart from works, as we are, by grace, through what Jesus has done. And I want to suggest that that can be one of the best excuses not to do anything. <laughs> Famous story of the Lutheran pastor on his deathbed proudly said he never did a good work in his life. That was supposed to be his passage. But somehow, we have to do something if we are to realize who we are as baptized Christians. Now, in the text this morning, Clearly what we have is Jesus being courted again by his opponents. They're always waiting for him to do just something wrong so they can say, well, he really can't be that much of a prophet. Look, he doesn't do what we are called to do. And he is talking about eating with unwashed hands, um, these things that they say will defile you. Touching a dead person defiles you. Eating with unwashed hands defiles you, and it is brought to such a point that almost Jesus has to swing the pendulum in the entire opposite direction. And he says, listen to me, Notice and understand. There's nothing outside of a person that by going in can defile. It is the things that come out that are defiled. From out of the human heart come evil intentions, and then he rolls them right off, one right after. And certainly in Jesus' time, the heart is the central point. It is the mind, it is the will, it is where everything, every intention comes from. And so what he is saying is, when you come right down to it, all of these other things are what Martin Luther might have called adiaphora. Adiaphora means of secondary importance. For example, how you structure worship. He would talk about adiaphora. Does it really matter? see if this point or this tradition is observed, he would say, no. What you need for the gathering of the people is the reading of the word, the preaching of the word, and the celebration of the Eucharist. What you surround that with is adiapha. It doesn't mean it has no importance, but it is secondary to why you are here in the first place. Now, I would pretty much bet, you see, that so far this morning you have heard two pieces of music by Claude W. Say. And I was not brought up to think that that type of music was to be brought into the church. Somehow, if it wasn't a hymn, it didn't belong. And believe me, being brought up in Catholic church during the 1950s, I heard the most atrocious hymns that you could ever imagine, sung by a woman high in the choir loft whose tremolo was only faster than that which is on the organ. It was something to truly hear. But all of a sudden, I remember um, the uh, Marcel Dupre, the great composer for organ, he wrote this spectacular piece of music. And after he finished playing it, people were appalled and said, you're playing that in the church? It has no church structure. It has no hymn structure. It has nothing that brings people to faith. And Dupre simply said, but it's music. Who do you think the author of all music is? It belongs anywhere where notes are brought together in a structure. 
that lifts you up in some way or shape or form. Keep in mind that the Messiah, Handel's wonderful piece of music, including the Alleluia Chorus, when it was sung and performed for the first time in London, it received the worst critics' reviews possible. It was noise, it was clatter, it was awful, said the critics. It should not be allowed to be played again. This is no way to praise God that day. And today, even the tiniest little choir will struggle to try to sing the Hallelujah Chorus, good, bad, or otherwise, because it has become part of who we are. Do you think that some of the hymns you sing, that you love, were wonderful to people? No, sir, we. How great thou art? People thought it was awful the first time they sang it. Now, you love it, don't you? Because it's part of your tradition. Now, on the other hand, you need to ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, I need to ask myself, what are those traditions that I have put a claim to that are moving out of secondary into primary levels? And people do that. I do that. You do that, too. You know, is it all that important, for example, uh, that I wear a skull? I don't think so, but it's a tradition. <coughs> I would hope you see that if I got up here and preached without a skull, that what I had to say was as important or not, if what I did wear a skull or not. I love the changing of color. And you're going to see some beautiful color because we have wonderful new red pyramids and white and blue pyramids and they're absolutely stunning. And the colors remind us of what season we're in and they're beautiful. You're going to like them. They're really gorgeous. If we didn't have them, would it be okay? Or do we want to raise those things to a primary level? We always have to be careful in doing these things. And Jesus warns us, when you get involved in these types of things, it's so easy, you see, to raise them up, but then to lower the things, as he says, which truly defile a person. Evil, fornication, theft, murder, slander, pride, folly. All of these things become almost, oh well, I'm almost human. But at least the green pyramids are right. <laughs> ah, we remember to change the pyramids to white. Yes, and that's good and it's important, but it is not primary. It is so easy for us to fall into that type of trap that you see, while in the midst of looking at the beautiful green pyramids, we think to ourselves, well, 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 look, there she is this morning. She thinks I don't know. She insulted me last week. She went wrong. You see what I mean? We're all human like that. And we fall into those type of traps before we realize it. All of a sudden, what is truly important has become a second level, and the unimportant brings up to this upper level, and there we are, and there is Mark saying to us, beware, beware, because the human condition allows for that. In this day and age, we don't like to talk about that as being sinful. It's so much easier to say, it. I was weak. I'm not really sinful, I'm just weak. I need to work on that a little bit better. But the reality is all of that lives right within ourselves and it's there to pounce at any given moment. And when suddenly all those little tiny secondary things fill us up, it's almost as if to say to God, I can't think about how weak I am, so I'm going to cling to this tradition or that tradition, and that will be the sign of who I am except it won't work. It can't work. It's totally unimportant. So, here we have it in this wonderful text. But if you split that, by the way, take, take, if you would, your bulletin home, and after the service, read it on Monday or Tuesday. Read the Gospel first, then go back to James. And James says this, all the be ye doers of the word. Do the things that you're called to do. And by the way, if any of you think you are religious, which, by the way, is a secondary matter, how, I, I gotta ask you, do truly religious acting people make you nervous? 
they make me nervous. They really do. They want to know if I can quote a hundred pieces of scripture. Now, and, and every now and then, sometimes, you know, if I'm traveling somewhere, uh, oh, your clergy, are you familiar with Deuteronomy 12, 1? I don't know. Here we go. Proof, you see, that memorization of scripture becomes the primary focus and all of a sudden, they don't hear James that says, but be doers of the word. If you've heard something that's plausible, then you ought to get out there and do it. Over and over and over. The famous story of me being on a plane in my clerks, traveling out to Omaha, and I sit next to a woman, and she's dying to find out what I am and why I'm there. Are you a Catholic priest? No. Silence. Then she notices my wedding ring. You must be Episcopalian. <laughs> no. And I'm not going to answer. Finally, she says, Well, what are you? <laughs> I said, I'm a Lutheran pastor. She goes, Oh. <laughs> we had an aunt that was Lutheran. I never liked her. <laughs> <laughs> my collar had become primary to her head. It really was secondary. Had I not worn it, that conversation would never have happened. But she raised it to a level where it didn't belong. You see, we do this all the time. So our, our trick, what we need to do constantly, especially here at St. Luke, as we build ourselves up, as we grow, as we do new things, is to be very, very careful that we don't grab a hold of those things that really aren't important. We may try throughout the years various new things. Not all of them are going to work. But it doesn't matter. If it didn't work, okay, put it aside and try something else. There's no need for repercussions that we had. You simply try to do something else and to do it a little bit better. And there's no need, you see, at that point to simply say, we're going to do this until it works. By God, if it kills the whole congregation, it's going to work. It doesn't matter. And those are those times when we have to stop and think that as a community and ask ourselves, where are we going? What are we doing? And if James calls us to be doers of the word, then that word goes right back to the gospel and says, be careful, because within you is the possibility of all of these things coming forth. Hold on to me, because without me you can do nothing. So, this, by the way, you can take home. What are all things that are important in life that are secondary to you? One last story of my parents. When he retired, my father decided he was going to, uh, to kind of rearrange the kitchen cupboards. Which he did. Much to my wife's chagrin. My wife, my mother. But that's okay, you see, because my mother went down with my sister and kind of rearranged his tool bench. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was said. Nothing was said. But you see, the conversation never happened that said, this is not important. And as a result, a little feud went on that didn't have to happen. Let's not let this happen in our church. Next week is Rally Day, and we are going to come up with this theme of Rally Day throughout the year. It's called, I Love My Church. Let us hope that we love it enough to put important things before those secondary things, those traditions which belong here, the word of God 